Okay, folks, why don't we begin? Uh, my name is Fred Pizzicani. I'm the president of Foam Tech. Um, I'm going to talk to you about foreign materials, particle control, particle identification today. Um, what I'd really like to do is uh, um, leave you with the idea that a lot of contamination you may be dealing with is more preventable uh, than we currently think. Um, obviously, in medical device, uh, FM is a major source of device rework and rejects, um, and sometimes CAPAS. Um, typically, what we're presented with is um, I'll just go up here. Typically what we're presented with is we see contamination on the device and then there's a lot of guessing and speculation and work to try to find out where the contamination uh, may, may have originated from. Uh, as we all, anybody who's done this before and has been part of a CAPA, that's often a very fruitful, fruitless process and you wind up shutting the clean room down, you do a deep clean, um, and hope it doesn't come back again, and six months later when it does, uh, you repeat the process. So um, I think we've all been there. Um, you know, in my first engineering class, um, the professor really made a point to make sure that we understood that the first step was describe the situation, describe the problem. Because if you don't describe the problem, it's really hard to come up with a systematic design. And one of the things that we find with FM that makes it so difficult is we can't describe where the FM is coming from. And we make a lot of guesses. We're going to show you how to address that. Um, so let's talk about some of the different um, issues or some of the different um, uh, um, scenarios that we run into. Obviously, when we're dealing with silicones or lubricious coatings or epoxies, um, FM is even more uh, insidious because it's a magnet. The, the devices are a magnet for uh, particles and the, the particulate be, can become embedded or worse, semi-embedded in the device leading to expensive rejects. Very difficult to rework that. Um, a lot of our components are plastic, so there's a static attraction um, uh, um, aspect to it. Um, you know, many clean rooms are multi-product, where you've got multiple products that are, that are being made in the same clean room, so, you know, there's all kinds of cross-contamination opportunities. These are high traffic environments, um, a lot of staff. So there's a lot of variables and a lot of potential sources for contamination and we, and we need to drill down to the two or three major sources so we can take action. Um, and then there's a lot of different processes in clean rooms that, are, are, that generate particles. Uh, wiping, cutting, bonding, grinding, um, uh, uh, curing, all kinds of, all kinds of um, uh, processes uh, generate particles that can contaminate devices. Um, you know, the current reality is there are many unidentified sources. Um, we oftentimes, uh, there's multiple open CAPAs for FM that are not really able to be closed with what the regulators would like to say is a root cause solution. And so I've seen, I've seen clients, um, as we mentioned, they do deep cleans, multiple deep cleans when they have an excursion. Um, they do more inspection. Um, they change their gauge R&Rs and they, they just substitute um, business risk for patient risk. They reject more devices. Um, so there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of productivity and quality impacts that foreign materials have, not least of which is it makes it difficult for the operator to carry out inspection on other aspects of the device. It's a lot of noise. Um, there's different processes, some of which have, are more prone to uh, contamination. Obviously, dip casting, um, um, uh, lubricious coating, Anything with silicones, leads are probably the, a great example. 
are subject to FM just because the, the, the materials are a magnet for FM. Um, and, and those typically lead to you know, high rates of rejects. Um, uh, me metallic parts, orthopedic stents, molded silicone devices, they, they can be reworked, but it's again a cost and, and how robust is the inspection. And then complex assemblies, you know, I guess heart valves would be the best example. Every heart valve, almost every heart valve made today involves operators literally tweezing particles and fibers off the device. So obviously, you know, very, very high labor um, consumption and not very robust. So what do customers do? What do what engineers and manufacturing people um, do? Obviously, the first thing is they do a lot of inspection. Um, you know, it's very, you know, certain, depending on the device, it's very, very difficult to get an inspection, uh, inspector fully trained up. At some companies, it takes six months to get an inspector uh, up and um, trained up and, and to identify um, and correctly meet the gauge r, &R studies for FM. Um, a lot of customers do triage. Um, they have uh, embedded, they have some particles, some uh, parts with embedded, um, some particles are, are on the surface, they can rework those uh, or accept those. The semi-embedded uh, um, uh, contamination is, is, is where we see very high rates of reject, especially on Labricious coated catheters. Um, a lot of customers have dedicated rework stations. Obviously, this is a is a productivity drag, but you see a lot of customers um, using foam swabs, tweezers, and the like to try to address uh, FM that may be on the device. Um, uh, anybody who's been through a Kappa knows how much management time. People are there three or four in the morning. You know, it's 24/7 until we solve it, and then eventually, you know, people give up and they just deep clean the clean room or 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 or, or reject the whole lot or whatever it is. But it's not it's not root cause based. So how do we identify FM? Has, has anybody ever tried to identify the FM in, in this area? Okay. So if you've used one of the outside labs, and there's a lot of good ones here. Um, Eurofins was here talking yesterday. These things can be a million dollars quicker than you know what, but they're minimum $200,000 um, to do it. And it's because they're using very invasive sampling techniques, oftentimes the clean room has to be shut down while they do the sampling because they're using SEM stubs and carbon tape um, uh, to collect the samples. And those are, that, that generates a lot of contamination in and of itself. I, let me pass it around to the people that came in. So basically what that is, is a, a, a wiper slash sampling tool. And you, it, it allows you to wipe down the whole clean room, workstations, equipment, and it, it's got a high static attraction. So it will hold particles and FM on the device, but not so tightly that you can't transfer it to a semi-DX or SEM stub or an FTIR um, sensor. So it allows you to do it allows you to do sampling much more quickly than you can now do it. And that that um, in when we talk about FM, quantity collected has a quality all of its all of its own. Especially for FTIR, especially for organic contamination, you need a lot of sample to get a good um, uh, robust FTIR result. So the, the net is the current techniques typically don't lend themselves to repeat. You can't really test out your action and see if it worked. You can only do it one time because it's so difficult and so invasive. So let's talk about um, next gen FM identification or what we like to call CSI for clean rooms. Everybody's seen the CSI show where they find a fiber on the victim, right? And now they're gonna, they've got 10 usual suspects. They've got 10 you know, guys that 
committed this kind of crime before or out on parole, and they're going to go around and do a collection of their house, and they miraculously find a fiber that matches exactly what was on the victim, okay? If it were that easy, right? Um, but in a clean room, because we've got so many multiple sources, um, oftentimes that's really difficult. So we're going to show you some of the things that we've done um, over the past 20 years to help customers out. So um, the, what we call the, the black, what a lot of people call the black wiper, we call it polycheck. Um, this allows you to do sample, uh, sample collection across the whole clean room. So we can give, we, you can get a really good picture of the FM signature in the clean room. We're then going to collect defective devices. And we're going to see if the contamination that you're rejecting for matches the contamination that we found in the clean room. And we have a huge library because we've been doing this for so long. So we can often identify, if it's a fabric, the actual mill that made the fabric. So we have very, very good fidelity. And now we're going to give you targets that you can take action on. We found a lot of polycellulose. We found a lot of polyethylene. They're coming from your bouffant. They're coming from your shoe cover. They're coming from your process. And you can now make a decision on taking action to eliminate that. So just to, just to, to recap, um, I don't know if anybody has ever used a SEM stuff before. Probably you haven't. Usually the lab has to send one of their technicians in to do this. But this is a very, very time-intensive time, time um, uh, process. Um, it, it, the SEM stubs themselves are $150 a piece. So it, you know, the costs add up very quickly. And we're not able to collect FM uh, you know, from a lot of recessed areas. And what we find out is the reason FM comes and goes, you know, we, we've all been there, everything's running great. And then we have that week where we can't make a part. I mean, every, every, part, is, every part is contaminated. So we're, and, and everybody's pulling their hair out trying to figure out what happened. Airborne counts are fine, everything's fine. But what happens is a lot of times FM, FM lodges in tooling and recessed areas and you know, maybe there's some maintenance done on, on that tooling over the weekend, and now it's spread everywhere. Um, so what PolyCheck allows us to do, and we also have that available in a swab, it allows you to do, it allows you to do very thorough um, um, sampling so we can identify uh, sources of, 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 of the contamination. So believe it or not, that, that is a... Um, what you see there is a sterile fill machine. Customer is, is filling vials of sterile injectables, and they were noticing they were having particulate in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the vial and on the outside of the vial. And, 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 and so we had them do their cleaning and then wipe down the, wipe down the, the machine after. And, and th all we did was use a UV light to expose the particles. Most of those particles are, as you can see there, they're pretty large, they're visible, they're three to 500 microns in size. Um, and that's in an ISO class five sterile, sterile fill area. So um, the key here is, we're, this is the stem stuff. So what we're able to do is take this wiper and then dab the stem stuff across the wiper so we can collect a lot of sample. So we're not just doing a poll where we're calling 10 people. We're doing a poll where we're calling 1,000 people. And that's really critical because, because especially for organic materials, and organic materials are almost any fiber, right? And, and we see a lot of fibers in medical device. You need a lot of sample to get a really good, robust reading of what the fiber is made up of. Okay, so we we have um, we we developed this not for customers. We developed it for our 
own internal manufacturing operation. So I'm pretty sure we have the only material science lab in a class 10 clean room because our biggest customer base is semiconductor. And they're worried about parts per trillion of things like titanium and sodium. So when we have a, when we, we find that on one of our lots, we're talking about rejecting a whole lot of material, and, which is very costly. So we, we invested in this capability um, to basically improve our manufacturing space. And basically we've increased our manufacturing space about 3x over the past 10 years, but our output has probably increased by two orders of magnitude because we're no longer we no longer have quarantine. We no longer have lot holds. We have such a good read on our, 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 our process. We've really got a deep understanding of our processes and our raw materials that I went over there a couple of years ago and I said, hey, we're no longer using our semi-DX. I don't see, been there five days. You know, I'm one of these guys, I'm simple. I walk the plant when I get there in the morning and I walk, there, walk the plant before I leave and I notice our semi-DX, which we spend five million bucks Nobody's using it. And the guy says, hey, we got a pretty good read on our, 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 our process. When we get a new material, we'll use it. Then I ran into a customer that was struggling with a Kappa, and I got, wait, listen, maybe we can help the customer. So I went back to our team and I said, hey, can we offer this service to customers? Now, we're not a, we're not a certified lab, so we can't give you a report that you can use with the FDA but we can give you a report that you can then take to a Nelson or a NAMSA and make sure your money is being very well spent because you've got go, no, go. You've got a lot of preliminary data. You've eliminated a lot of sources. So this is what our lab looks like. It's in a clean room. So let me give you some examples of what we see in the real world so that you guys will have an appreciation, uh, better appreciation for what's possible. So. This was a catheter, and you can see here we have some dark fibrous materials. The customer was convinced that because they were only wearing lab coats, shoe covers, and head covers, that that was from their clothing. That was from the operator's clothing. And it's not a bad guess because it's dark. You know, could it be a blue jean? Could it be a sweater? And it's okay to guess, but if you can analyze what it really is, stop guessing. Don't guess anymore. So we analyzed that, and sure enough, it was polycellulose from their wiper. A lot of times, people don't realize polycellulose changes color um, if you put other materials on it, if you put it through UV curing, you put it through heat curing, polycellulose will turn brown or blue or black, um, and it throws you off. Here's an example of a, um, a braided, uh, um, uh, I, I think it's a neurocatheter, and um, it's hard to see there, but there's a fiber up here that, that was embedded in the hydrophilic coating. This was a customer that um, we had done an assessment with four or five years ago, um, converted them to one of our materials. Uh, end of line rejects went from 7% to less than 1%. Spike, they've been running recently at 3%, so they asked us, hey, you know, I, I know you guys can't come down here during COVID. Can you send us your sampling kit and can we do a follow on assessment? They had acquired another company who they, so they, they integrated their production uh, line, their, their product into their current line. They used a different type of material. And sure enough, we found polyester and cellulose fibers that had crept back into their process. So again, this is an example of you can do follow on, you can do follow on work here because the sampling is so much more economical and cost effective. Um, this is a, uh, a, a limbs part made from uh, you know, silicone. Uh, obviously, the, the, uh, there's a fiber there, and it uh, turned out that was the polyester, uh, the wiper that they were using to wipe down their, their, their molds. Um, 
This is another interesting, um, you, you know, the customer was, was convinced that this was uh, um, um, uh, clothing related because it was dark in color. But uh, when we did the evaluation, when we did the analysis, uh, we found out it matched exactly against the two wipers they were using. Uh, this, again, is a, a, a very expensive reject. This is a, um, a, a catheter with a, a palladium marker bands. And um, they were rejecting about 12% uh, of their devices for, for FM and, and, um, and, and had done multiple CAPAs previously to try to identify this. And um, uh, we were able to help them identify the source of the fibers as cellulose. So what we do is we, we, have the, we have the customer do wipe down their critical surfaces, wipe down their parts, wipe down their equipment. They send that to us. We then do sample prep where we, in, first step is inspect the face of the wiper under a 200X microscope. We'll then um, look, we'll then We'll take the areas that are contaminated and we'll transfer the samples to a, the SEMI-DX and the, and the FTIR and we'll give you, so this is, uh, this is, this is again what, what it looks like, um, what a fiber looks like against a, a SEM stub. This is the sampling process we use where we just cut the face of the wiper with the SEM stub. And this is the kind of report that we'll generate. So you've cleaned X surface or Y machine. We've collected this kind of, of, of um, contamination. It's, does everybody know what SEMI-DX is and how it works? Sure. OK. So the beauty about SEMI-DX is you can get a picture. You can get a 3D point picture. So you can really get some clarity on what the, what the contamination looks like, but even more powerful, now we include the EDX so we can give you the elemental makeup on it. So you can distinguish, we can distinguish mills, different mills that made 316 stainless steel. We've done this enough so you can, we, we know certain mills have certain amount of chromium in it. So you can really get some good fidelity on this um, uh, using this method. So SEMI-DX is, great for inorganics. You can also use it for organics, but you have to be, it's pretty sophisticated. We don't have that capability, but Eurofins does, Nelson does. So you can use it to do uh, in, um, organics as well. But really what we use for, in, uh, for organics is we use FTIR. And FTIR has been around a long time. Everybody knows how to use it. The problem with FTIR is you need a lot of sample to get good fidelity. There's a lot of noise in most, in most readings and you don't, get, you don't get really good matching if you don't have a lot of sample. And that sample isn't, isn't um, contaminated. I see a lot of customers using tape They'll use tape to collect samples. The problem with tape is the adhesive has a st much stronger signal than the sample you're collecting. So very difficult to, that'll, that'll really, really um, cross-contaminate the sample process and, and prevent you from getting a good, a good picture on that. Uh, yes? So um, this was a this was a really interesting um, this was a really interesting um, case study here. This customer had converted to our wiper, 
and then we did a follow-up assessment on them to see how it was going, and we found, we still found cellulose. So we said, guys, you're still, you, there's cellulose somewhere in your process. Oh, no, we've eliminated, there's no way, you're sure that's our results, right? People, you know, they don't want to believe the data that's right in front of them. We found out that in their maintenance area, they were still outside the clean room, they were still doing, they were still using the cellulose paper-based wiper on their injection molding tooling. And that was cross-contaminating their whole process. So what we found here is that if you're, depending on the device you're, you're making, especially if it's silicone, if you're using fabric-based wiping materials anywhere, you're gonna have contamination everywhere. Um, while gowns, the clean room um, gowning industry does a fantabulous job, we have found almost very few examples of contamination coming from rewashable clean room gowns. But where clean room gowns are a vector, if you will, is you'll have one clean room that might be a control room or an ISO 9 room and it shares a change room with your ISO 7 and ISO 5 rooms. All of the garments in the change room will be contaminated from the, from the, from the lower level clean rooms. We, we do sampling, we do routinely just wipe down the sleeve of garments and we find, this is what we find on the garments. Here's another example of what, what we found on a, a, a lot of customers will use lower end wiping materials in their pass-throughs and their change rooms. And that contaminates the whole clean room. We found in semiconductor facilities, we, we have one customer that's literally in an ISO 1 clean room, only ISO 1 clean room I know about. They, they have operators um, stripped down completely. They have men's and women's change rooms, stripped down completely, you put undergarments on, you go through an air shower, you put your gloves on, you go through another air shower, then you put your final gown on and you go into the clean room. And we found cellulose in, in the clean room because that was what was used in the first, first clean room there. So fibers are like smoke in the old restaurants that had the no smoking sign. Smoke doesn't care about the sign it's going to diffuse from areas of greater concentrations to areas of lower concentrations. Curing ovens are a major source of contamination buildup. Um, a lot of times uh, uh, um, you'll, you'll go for, like I said, you'll go for weeks or months and you don't have an issue and then somebody changes, changes the, the filter in the oven or does some maintenance and all of a sudden contamination is everywhere. This is an a, a interocular lens manufacturer, very similar to the example I, I mentioned before. Um, they uh, sent their molds out for maintenance to their mold manufacturer. We, we found, we found uh, cellulose and cotton all over their devices. They were rejecting literally 12% of their devices for that material. Um, they swore up and down they weren't using cotton. We, we went through, checked their bomb, they weren't using cotton, but their mold shop that did the maintenance on the mold was doing a, was using a cotton swab before they shipped it back to them. So again, you can, because the sampling, uh, and I know I've said this a few times, but because the sampling is so inexpensive, we can go upstream to our vendors. So if we're having contamination um, that we've, we've eliminated from our clean room, there's a, way to, there's, a, there's a way to really go into your supply chain and understand where this is coming from. And obviously this took a long time, but the payoff was huge because they, 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 they literally eliminated about 90% about of those rejects. So what are the sources of contamination? Uh, the single biggest source of contamination in, that we found in medical device are the wipers themselves. 
Um, the, the, the polyester also can come from bouffants and shoe covers and face masks. Those are the other areas, those are the garment related materials. The rewashable garments, if your rewashable garments are in good condition, are not a major source. Um, obviously with metal, metal particles, um, uh, uh, machine to machine, uh, abrasion points, cutting operations, welding, grinding, those kinds of operations are, 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 are gonna generate a lot of, a lot of particles. Um, and, and, you know, surprisingly, we've probably done two or 300 assessments. Yes, we find hair. We, we find hair, but it's, it's surprisingly way down, way down on the, on the Pareto chart. It's not a significant issue at most customers. These are the type, types of customers, you know, where we've, these are where they had open CAPAs, and this is an example of the range of type of customer that we've, we've, we've sampled. And this is the, this is the, the, the um, contamination by type. Uh, as I mentioned, wipers are the largest source, which, which um, and most customers don't, are very surprised by that. But when you think about how wipers are used and the amount of friction and the proximity to the part, um, it makes more sense. Obviously, process materials um, and metallic particles kind of go hand in hand. Um, a, again, a lot of that is from the, the, the cutting, the grinding, especially if you have a braiding operation or a winding operation, you need to pay careful attention to those. Um, environmental contamination is, is relatively low down on the, on, the, on the totem pole, and that can be mostly increased by improving uh, mop, mopping. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit in how the clean room is maintained. Unknown particles, why do I highlight that? Um, because um, we, this pro our process is a comparative process. If, if we don't have a sample of the, if we don't have the sample in a, libra in a library and we haven't collected a sample, we can't give you the source. Let me take you, let me walk you through a case study. So, um, This customer was using, um, was using um, our foam wipers to, had been using for years, foam wipers to wipe down the device itself, but they were using a fabric wiper, a non-woven wiper, as their general purpose cleaner maintenance, you know, wiping down tables, um, uh, wiping down workstations at, before and after the operator came back to work. Um, they're, they're, the, the, they were rejecting about 7% of their devices. Each device was about $2,000 uh, in cost. And they were reworking about 40 to 60% of the devices. Um, so obviously we we're trying to, and they were having, and they had multiple open campus. So we, they, they were also using uh, the fabric wiper as a workstation for their tools. So they'd lay the tools down on the, on the wipers and, and, and they changed that to foam. We found a lot of contamination on the microscope. They had been using, the, they had been using foam to wipe down the device you know, for, for the previous five or six years, so this, hadn't been, this wasn't a change. So let me walk you through this chart. The, the blue plot represents the amount of end of line um, uh, uh, rejects that they were they were facing on the on the right axis there. The yellow line is the amount of in process recleaning they were doing. So process A has cleaned it and passed it, and process B now inspects it and realizes they have to to reclean it. So you can see that in, in week four of March, 
they implemented um, foam wipers across the whole room. Mind you, this was a multi-product room. And what we had found, found is that they were getting a lot of, there was a lot of contamination was coming from processes in the other end of the room. So we found a lot of cellulose particles that had been exposed to a certain etching process that was used on a different line. So they had to change, to do the evaluation, they changed the whole room out. But you can see um, within a month and a half, they had basically redefined the baseline levels for both rework and rejects. So um, because foam is more expensive than the polycellulose wiper, they decided, hey, let's only use foam on the most critical steps. So in, in week four, they went back to using polycellulose on the other lines that didn't have the high reject rates and weren't $2,000 a device. And you can see that within a week, the reject level had spiked back up to, no, to just about where we left off at in, in March. So the moral of the story here is, if your device is critical, if your device is costly, um, I would look at getting rid of fabric throughout the whole facility. Because if you use it anywhere, it'll be everywhere. So um, over, the, over the next year, um, we, we, we converted three plants um, to this material. Um, they were able to, productivity increased 28%. Um, and they had about a $1.3 million um, cost savings as a result of that. So uh, what I'd like to leave you with is that a lot of contamination that now, hey, look, we've built in 5% reject into our bomb. That's in our, in, in our budget. And as long as we're below 5%, we're happy. There's a lot of contamination that if we, if we do the sampling and we do, do the work, we can identify it and prevent that contamination. That's what I'd like to leave, leave you with.